Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic Guy. Remember it so you don't have to. Today's film is, um, interesting. And when I say interesting, I mean it has a very interesting history. The name of the film is The Thief and the Cop. Or The Princess and the Cop. Or Arabian Night. Or An Abomination of Fness, which is what most people call it. If a film can't decide on what the title is, how can it decide on the audience it's going to appeal to? Is it appealing to toddlers, to older children, to the mainstream Disney crowd, the strange surreal fantasy crowd? What? What? Well, before I talk about the film, let's talk about... the film. Once upon a time, there's an animator named Richard Williams. He's said to be one of the great animation directors, having done the Chuck Jones-produced Christmas Carol, that trippy Raggedy Ann and Andy film, and probably his biggest accomplishment, the animation for Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Yet before all of that, he started production on The Thief and the Cobbler in 1964. It was released in 1993. What the f happened all that time? Apparently the film was independently funded and Williams went on and on saying that this was going to be his masterpiece. Because of this, the film took years and years of perfecting and financing to finally get it finished. In fact, one of the actors died before the film even got released. Vincent Price recorded his dialogue over 20 years before it ever saw the light of day. And as of now, it continues to be the longest time it's ever taken to complete an animated picture. Because this turkey was taken so long, the film was bought by the Completion Bond Company and kicked Williams off the project, having it released by Miramax and putting together their own half cut that is still considered to be the bucket of a This is that version. So, let's see how this magnum opus went to magnum in The Thief and the Cobbler. We start out appropriately enough with a little backstory. Legend has it that each shooting star is really an Arabian night riding across the heavens. Oh, um, don't tell me. That's a lot of fish. That's right. Matthew Broderick is the star of this movie. Long before the heroic tales of Aladdin and Alibaba, the first Arabian night was chosen. You hear that, Disney? We sort of beat you to it. The golden city of Baghdad. High atop its tallest tower, were three golden balls whose magic protected it from the evil King One-Eye and his army of darkness. <laughs> According to the prophecy, if the balls were ever removed, Baghdad would be in great danger. No comment. So we finally see our hero, simply known as Tech, a pretty pale-looking fellow for someone who lives in the desert. At the time, I was a poor orphan working as a cobbler's apprentice. Life was simple. And in answer to your question, no, I don't know why he looks like Beetlejuice's Raggedy Ann doll. But he's not the only main character. We also have the thief, played by Jonathan Winters. He never talks in the movie. Hurrah! But sadly, someone decided to put a microphone in his brain. Hurrah! What a dumb. Nobody lives like this except college kids. At first this isn't too bad, but trust me, it gets real annoying real fast. So while he tries to steal from the cobbler, the Yellow Submarine Pride Parade is happening outside, welcoming the arrival of the Wizard Zigzag, played by Vincent Price. <laughs> So Tack is captured as we cut to our love interest in the movie, Princess Yum Yum. Okay, hold on. Tack, Zigzag, Yum Yum. These aren't names, these are words an infant is trying to say for the first time. Tack, Zigzag, Yum Yum. Okay, so the princess has a real original backstory. Are you ready for this? I bet you've never heard this one before. Listen. She's tired of her boring life. And, in a bizarre twist, she dreams of wanting more! I know I could do more, if I just had the chance. This life I live in regal splendor seems a waste. I do hope there's a tired, unoriginal musical number to tell us what we already know she feels. Born just to delight. Ah, oh, right on cue. And bred to behave. But she... Why is this song bland? I 
mean, this is like eating styrofoam on wheat toast. It's that bland. It's like someone approached somebody like Alan Macon and said, Hey, can you write an original song? Sure, what's it about? It's about a princess who's dreaming of more. Oh, all right. Oh, and just like those other Disney songs where the landscapes and grand visuals are stunning, this musical performance has spinning, and spinning, and, uh, more spinning! It's like we got the choreography from the Tasmanian Ballet Theater! So Tack is brought to the king as Zigzag's prisoner when Yum Yum meets him for the first time. Princess informs her father that she needs a cobbler, so he's called in to fix her shoe. Meanwhile, we discover that Zigzag has an evil plan to, you guessed it, take over the of course world. With Princess Yum Yum at my side, the crown is mine by right. Oh, by the way, did I mention that he speaks entirely in rhyme? Greatest king of all the earth, this lowborn cobbler of no worth attacked me in the square today. Shall we take his head away? I'm not even sure I really get it. Why does he speak in rhyme if everybody else doesn't? Is there a reason for it? I mean, what makes him so special? I don't get... Excuse me. Hello? Greetings, critic. This is Vincent. Price. Wait a minute, THE Vincent Price? Like THE Vincent Price? Yes, how many stars of stage, screen, and Tim Burton do you know? But wait a minute, you've been dead for several years! Well, you see, just like the dialogue for this picture, I recorded this phone message several years ago. So I set my phone on a timer to call you and give you this message. Wait, so everything you're saying right now is a recording? <laughs> yes. How is that possible? How do you know everything I'm gonna say? Well, uh, many a fortnight ago, I made a Faustian pact with the nefarious forces of the Neverworld, so I can see into the future with a hundred percent accuracy. I know everything that you're going to say. Oh, come on, that's yes. bull****. You can't predict what I'm... I'm... Stop that! that. I, I mean it, stop it! Peter Piper picked the Piper Pickle Peppers. Toibo, Toibo, Toibo! She sells seashells she sells by the... Came out. You see, I am awesome. All right, recording of Vincent Price. What do you want? This cacophony of cock you've paraded over my fierce elucidations strikes me with humiliation and discomfort. You see, I want you to know why I stammered in rhythmic drones of I am the contaminator in this cinematic adventure. Uh, Ruamater. You mean explain why you whined? Yes. Okay. Well, why? Blast! I can't remember. <laughs> That's just great. Years after your death, and you can't remember why you rhymed in that movie. No, no, I do. It's on the tip of my tongue. Oh, it had something to do with Rock Hudson and the banana cream pie. Okay, I'm hanging up right now. Oh, and do look out for that pumpkin. Oh! What? P pumpkin? Pumpkin what? 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 Pumpkin what? So we see the cobbler interact with the princess as he fixes her shoe. The princess was so beautiful, and I was just an ordinary cobbler. He doesn't have a lot to say for himself. Oh, don't worry. His inner monologue that never shuts the f*** up will make up for that. I tried to impress her with some cobbling tricks. Keep your eyes on your work, cobbler. <sighs> Why can't I ever talk when it matters? You can say that for all the lines in this movie. Speaking of which, the other inner monologue rambler comes in looking for something to steal. Soap. Oh, so that's what it looks like. I've heard of it in storybooks and songs. What's that? Oh, a naked lady. Doe. But wait, a golden scratcher. But scratcher! But scratcher! But scratcher! But scratcher! But scratcher! So he steals the scratcher and runs into the cobbler, who tries to stop him. Halt! In the name of King Nod! I couldn't believe what I was saying. Suddenly I was defending the crown. And I have to admit, this is one of the coolest, yet still trippiest chase scenes you'll ever see in an animated film.
So after that trip out, Zigzag sees that Tex finished the shoe, and so he puts him in a cell. I was sure I would never see the princess again. Little did I know that she was thinking about me, too. I close my eyes. Oh, yay! Another underwritten song to rape us with its blandness. So soft and warm and clear. Yeah, you thought the first song was bad? Just listen to the lyrics on this one. Don't fight your feelings, says my heart. A heart I will obey. Am I feeling love? Wow. That's the kind of laziness that you only dream about. You know, because you're so f lazy. I mean, are they even trying? Anyone can come up with this sh My heart will love a lovey love love But only in my dreams But because I sing with singiness The dreams I dream I'll dream My heart love So we cut to the next day as Tack is still locked away in his cell. I had to escape. Oh, shut up! This has more inner monologue than Samus from Metroid Other M! Zigzag had ordered a polo match in Yum Yum's honor. Of course, she was far from impressed. If only Adam was here to tell me what to think. So the next day, Tack breaks free out of his cell as the thief tries to steal the golden balls from the top of the castle. Finally, I was free. The grass felt soft on my feet. Why don't I monologue about that for several hours? The grass is green. A frog is green. I'm sure I can talk about this in great detail somehow. Eventually, the thief manages to get the golden balls as he, here's a shocker, monologues to himself. You're gonna buy me a castle by the sea. <laughs> and you're gonna buy me everything I need to turn the basement into a rec room. And with you, um, I, I, I tell you, sweetheart, I'm going to Disneyland. You know, it's funny. When I hear pop cultural references in a film that takes place in Arabia, I think of Aladdin. But this was being made before Aladdin. Apparently, Disney animators drew influence from this movie when it was being made that helped Aladdin get off the ground. And after that came out, the new producers of this film drew influence from Aladdin. So Aladdin ripped off this, only to have this rip off Aladdin. Basically, the film is a product of animated inbreeding. Suddenly, this is all starting to make more sense, isn't it? So a soldier comes and tells the king that an evil army is brewing, led by an evil man named one -Eye. One? Uh, I? One? I? This one eye? One eye? I prefer apocalyptic people. So as the king prepares his army, Zigzag manages to get the golden spheres from the thief. <laughs> now that I have the balls... Good night, everybody. I will go see the king. Zigzag decides to give the balls to one eye while the princess has an idea about how to solve the problem. Apparently there's a witch in the desert that's all knowledgeable. But who's gonna go talk to her? Where do I find this witch? You? Never. Much too dangerous. Father, I'm smarter than any man in this city. And faster than your clumsy henchman. As was proven by the previous scenes of her... running fast and... Being smart. Okay, all you did was sing and spit. I don't know how that qualifies you to be a speedy gun Einstein. That's correct. So she chooses the cobbler to be his guy because he's lived all his life in the village and has no idea how the desert works. Oh, I mean, uh, has great knowledge of the desert and all its secrets. You can tell how many times he's been out there by the incredibly dark tan that he has all over his body. Clearly, he is no stranger to the sun. Okay, so they set out into the desert under the cover of Royal Escort to find the sudden plot device known as the Witch. 
Oh. Well, wait a minute. What happened to his skin? He was looking like Tim Burton's Prince of Persia. Now he has a tan like George Hamilton. I know what you're thinking. It's because he went out in the sun that he suddenly tanned. But look, as they're leaving, his skin is a different color. And it's nighttime. This doesn't add up. What, did the animator suffer a fatal heart attack? <laughs> and then somebody else took over and forgot to tell him that tech is pale? Continuity! It's not just for the coherent anymore! So they run into a bunch of desert outlaws called the Brigands. They sing another song that makes you want to scalp yourself, and then they decide to join them in their search for the witch. At last, we reached the hands of glory. All we had to do was wait until the next day when the sun would be directly overhead, and the magic moment would arrive. Or maybe the writers could have just had us arrive on time, but we found this wasted more animation, and let's face it, we're on a roll with that. So they see the witch who has some confusing, yet somehow still generic advice to give our heroes. Believe in yourself is what you lack. Attack, attack, and never look back. Oh, I also have some battle strategies over there, but um, I find f***ing riddles is a lot more fun. So we see Zigzag hand the balls over to One Eye, and they prepare to take over the city. One Eye's attack! You know, we're never even told what kind of power the balls have, or even what they do. We never see them in motion, and we don't really know how powerful they are. Are we just supposed to assume they're, uh... <laughs> So One Eye's army attacks with whatever the f this thing is. As Zigzag tries to take out Tack. Attack! 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 Well, I guess when you make a machine that implausible, you're just begging for it to be taken down in an implausible way. But there's still the final battle to be had with Zigzag and Tack. <laughs> That was easy. Your mind, Toots. Ah! End of the ride, Zigzag! <laughs> what, Cobbler? I don't think he said anything. So Tack defeats the wizard by sewing him up, the thief gets the golden balls back, and One-Eyed's army is destroyed. And in the end, we find that non-threatening blandness wins the day. <laughs> So next time you see a shooting star, be proud of who you really are. Do in your heart what you know is right, and you too shall become an Arabian Knight. Unless you're an animator who spends most of its life and thousands of dollars trying to tell the story he's always wanted to tell. In which case, you're totally screwed. Alright, so I have good news and bad news. The bad news is this movie sucks! It's edited clumsily, the songs are forgettable, the characters are annoyingly bland, as well as annoying. It's just a horrible release. However, the good news is, there is a re-edit of this movie called the Recobbled Cut. This uses unfinished animation and storyboards to tell the version that Richard Williams always wanted to see. And let me tell you, it's a lot better. There's no Matthew Broderick or Jonathan Winters, no sh songs and virtually no dialogue from the main characters, which is actually pretty unique. Because of this, most of the story is told strictly through the animation, which while some people may see as an acquired taste, is still pretty spectacular. There's so much more expression in just the movements of the character than there is with that horrible inner monologue. It knows what it wants to be, a surreal, artistic, practically silent movie, unlike the Miramax cut, which tries so hard to appeal to everyone that it appeals to no one. And while I can't say the recobbled cut is a fantastic movie, it's certainly more impressive and much more entertaining. It's worth checking out for any fan of animation. If you just type in Thief and the Cobbler recobbled cut on Google or YouTube, you'll come across it eventually. Check it out and see some really great animation. I'm a nostalgia critic, I remember... Hello? Critic, I knew you would blow me off after that last phone call, so I sent it bomb in your house before it was built. Clever me. But don't worry, it's set to go off in exactly 50 seconds. You'd better run, big boy. I remember so you don't have to. One, two, skip a few, 50 